Today's loss prevention webinar is on is on managing workplace injuries. Um, this is something that many of you have to have to deal with, really at whatever whatever job um, you may have. If you're in a management position, um, you probably have to deal with people who may be injured from time to time. So we wanted to go through and talk about how do you really deal with with these injuries and how do you make make the best outcome possible there. Um, each year at the trust, we have uh, right in the neighborhood of a thousand up to maybe 1,200 workers' compensation injuries. So it is a, a significant impact um, on our membership out there. These injuries uh, vary from very minor, just first aid uh, type injuries, up to fatal, fatal injuries. And uh, and we of course do not want to ever have one of those, but unfortunately they do happen. Um, some are very simple, some are very complex when it comes to dealing with workers' compensation cases. And uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the whole gamut of, of this. Um, each, one of these, each one of these workers' comp cases has the potential to be fraught with, uh, with problems. Um, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with their health, and, uh, and that, can, uh, that can end up causing us some uh, causing us some grief and consternation, both for us who are managing the claims as well as the people who are who are injured. This is a tough this is a tough thing for somebody to be injured. Here they are, they're a valuable employee, and then something happens and they get injured and their life has changed. They're concerned, they're worried about their uh, being able to pay the bills, they're worried about their um, how well um, they're perceived in your organization. Wow, am I going to lose my job because of, because of this? They've got a lot of a lot of questions that happen. Plus, they may be affected for the rest of their life from this injury. So, this is something that we need to be need to have uh, concern and and uh, show that for the uh, for the people who are injured. Um, at the same time, we're trying to manage these claims to make sure that we get people as healthy as quickly as we can, as and then get them back to work uh, so they can be productive. Um, many studies out there show that uh, show that um, the indirect costs of injuries may be five times the direct costs, which are which are uh, really monumental when we look at the total cost to the to the trust membership. Sometimes uh, sometimes up to four million dollars per year in workers' compensation costs, or even more um, if you start five timesing that. Uh, those indirect costs and lost productivity and other challenges that that affect us in our operations it 's a big deal, and so we need to pay attention to what 's uh, to what 's going on with these injuries here 's kind of our uh, performance over the years and i 'll explain this graph first of all i 'll malign the graph just a little bit i don 't like it very much because it goes the opposite direction of, uh, of what we would expect. It actually goes from the right to the left, oldest being on the right. Um, those blue bars in there are, are what we call medical only claims. They're ones where somebody gets a cut or some, some sort of a simple injury that they go to the emergency room, uh, be seen, get stitches, and go back to work the same day, no lost time. And uh, we, we have more of these than any other type of claim that are, that are out there. Most of our injuries are, are fairly simple that way. People are seen and uh, treated, and they get right back to work. Um, they, there still can be complications that go along with that, but that's really the, the bulk of what we see out there. They don't have as big of a big of impact on our total cost, even though there, there is a significant cost to that. They don't have as big of impact as the ones that are kind of, I guess that's a brown color. Doug, Doug the non-colorblind guy, can tell me what the... Uh, what that color is? Is that brown? Oh, he must have muted. I did. It's brown. Your uh, your claims with benefits are brown, uh, and the incident bar is green. I got the green and blue pretty good. That's just kind of a weird color of <laughs> color there. Those brown bars there. Those are those are the lost time claims, and uh, those are ones where people are injured bad enough that they end up. Uh, being off work, taken off work by their by their doctor, and uh, and so they can't come to work, and they get benefits. They're paid two thirds of their uh, of their wage uh, to basically be home, getting better. Now that two thirds of, of their wage is is tax free, and so it may not be quite as 
um, as big of a challenge as as we may look at that. Um, and the green bars that we have on there, those are what we call incidents. They're ones where it's it's more of a first aid type claim or something happened, you know, it might be like a blood exposure. Um, police officer or EMS personnel are out there dealing with a person or a patient and, and they end up getting blood on their skin um, and they're concerned about potential for hepatitis or, or HIV or some, or some other infection. Um, and so they want to report that case. That's good. Um, we encourage you, we encourage you to report those, those zero dollar claims, the ones that, hey, we just want to make sure that we're covered in the event that there's a, uh, in the event that something comes up down the road. Um, so, so we like those numbers to to be there. We know there's going to be some of those those incidents taking place. We want those those medical only and particularly the lost time claims or indemnity claims to go down. We've been hanging pretty level at the same time. We've we've been adding a significant number of new employees to our workers' compensation pool. So, so we are we are probably on uh, as far as our rate goes um, going down, even though it looks like hey we're hanging pretty steady there. Um, however, costs continue to go up, and if we want to control those, you know, a lot of that's just based on medical costs. If we want to control those, we need to we need to pay particular attention to how we handle injuries in the workplace. Um, what type of injuries do we have? It's always good to talk talk about these. Sprains and strains are our number one uh, year in year out. Sprains and strains drive the the cost as well as the total number of claims that we see out there. This is uh, these are shoulders, backs, knees. Uh, elbows, those type of those type of things where we pull a muscle, where we, where we uh, have a have tendon or ligament injury, and uh, we just did a regional tour training on on this subject. It's one that we really want to focus on getting people prepared to work. Um, next next one are slips and falls, very common both in both in workers' compensation as well as well as our general liability uh, lines of insurance. Um, where people slip on ice or sometimes falls happen because people uh, wrap their feet up in the phone wire under their desk or, or some other thing like that. They trip over a chair, uh, many different uh, causes of slips and falls, but that's, that's very common. Cuts and punctures are right up there. These don't drive the cost nearly as much, but they do drive the, drive the pain. This is a very common Instant that we have where people are uh, people are sliced by a piece of equipment that they have that they're using. A lot of times we end up slicing ourselves with our own knife or, or other tool that we have. Um, and the last category in in the top four that we have there, are struck by or injured by, and this could this could come from a number of different things. Whether it's a, a, a part flying, um, sometimes it's being struck by a vehicle or an ATV. Uh, we have we have several of those each year, and sometimes it's being struck by a person. Um, ensuring law enforcement personnel that are out there dealing with people who really don't want to go to jail or or uh, have some some beef with the police um, will end up having having some of those officers injured uh, by the by the people that they're dealing with. So that's really kind of kind of the the most common injuries that we have out there. How do we go about dealing with those? Number one, we want to build. Um, uh, we want to uh, build a plan. Uh, be prepared for what's going to happen. Um, we, you know, we want to eliminate injuries wherever we can. But we have to realize that even if we have great fire safety precautions in our building, we're still going to put a fire extinguisher in there. We need to make sure that we're prepared. To handle these incidents as they as they happen. Um, on this, I put on here: manage or be managed. We have to go out uh, with an open mind and and say, I'm going to handle this claim um, or this case and make sure it works out best for the employee as well as as well as the company um, to to manage costs as at the same time we we'll get the employee healthy as soon as we can. Um, if we just stand back and let those claims take course on their own, um, they might work out right, um, but in many cases that's where we run into problems is if we're just not paying attention to what's happening. 
Uh, we have a lot of resources through through our uh, adjusters, claim adjusters, as well as loss prevention here. And anybody at the trust could help out help out from our end. Uh, but there's also lots of other resources out there that that you can use to help you manage these claims um, and get people better. Um, like I said, um, prevention should be first. But after that accident happens, we need to make sure we're we're ready to provide the appropriate care have steps to follow that not only we understand, but the workers themselves understand what they need to do to, uh, to make sure that their claim is paid, that they get the care they need, and, uh, and we get them back to health as soon as we can. Um, we want to manage our injuries, like I said, to control costs, but uh, primarily to get that person healthy. Like I said, their, their life is turned upside down when they have an injury and they're concerned about things. If we have a if we have a plan in place that is clear and, and intelligent, then they're going to feel better about their situation, and, and we take a lot of that insecurity out of, uh, of them having an injury. Um, next, uh, we want to be prepared. Be prepared. OSHA tells us uh, this. This is from from OSHA. They say personnel and supplies commensurate with the hazards of the workplace should be provided. So depending on the type of work that we're doing, we may have a big, uh, we may have a big first aid kit, we may have an AED, we may have a, a, a really minimal uh, first aid kit. Um, first aid training uh, is, is also something that we need to do to be prepared, as well as having emergency supplies available. Let's run through that real quick. So training. Everybody needs to be trained at even at a minimal level. They need to be able to understand, identify when there's an emergency, and identify what type of injury, and be able to get the appropriate help. We don't expect everyone to do first aid. You may you may train all of your uh, employees to do that. We encourage that, uh, but you might also say, hey, we're going to we're going to train a specific number of first responders uh, to do this task and we'll, and we'll have adequate for the, for the staffing that we have out there. But we do recommend that you, that you provide training to the biggest number of, of employees that you can. Um, they need to know how to, everybody needs to know, to know how to summon help. help. That might be dialing 911. Um, sounds pretty simple. However, if we don't know our phone systems or we don't know the procedure to get that uh, get that call out, that could be a problem. Sometimes remote locations might be a challenge. So how do you how do we go about uh, notifying uh, emergency responders or first responders within our organization that we need help? Um, provide care, um, and and we'll talk about that just a little bit more in a minute. R report the incident. Timely instant reporting is is critical to helping to helping this person uh, get the care they need and get healthy. Um, supervisors and first responders need to have additional training. Um, probably, you know, first first general first aid training that we do. Doug goes around the state and provides this. Um, does a great job with that. Um, AED training and CPR training. Might be additional things that you would you would look into. Everybody should be able to do CPR. Um, it's a, it's a shame when you see people uh, have a heart attack and there's nobody there that knows CPR. It's a really simple uh, a simple task uh, to provide CPR, and uh, and once again, Doug can do that and get you get your people trained up for that. But uh, like I said, at, at a minimal level, supervisors, leads, anybody in management position should have some basic first aid skills to be able to identify what, what an emergency, what type of care is needed, and provide those that basic first aid to stop bleeding, um, and and then get people to the, the training uh, to the uh, care that they need. Um, <laughs> emergency supplies under OSHA, we're required to provide the, the supplies that are commensurate with the type of work we're doing. If we're in an office environment, we probably need a very basic first aid kit, something that provides, like it shows in here, there's an ANSI standard. And this is the basic level, and then it goes through the different, uh, different types of those. And, uh, and if any of you are interested in that, I can send you a copy of the, of the standard there. Um, 
And so to, at a minimum level, they say you need to have an absorbent compress, band-aids, um, tape, antiseptic, burn gel, exam gloves to protect the person providing the, uh, providing the aid, a sterile pad, and a triangular bandage. That's the basic level that, that we provide. Most of us will probably buy something a step or two up from that, and depending on the work environment, we may have to provide something a little more than that. If you if you uh, have a uh, you know an organization that's out doing search and rescue or EMS, you know you're going to have significant more materials there. But if we're if we're uh, potentially out doing work with heavy equipment, uh, with hand tools that could cause some serious injuries, think about uh, bumping up that first aid kit. And as I bring that up, um, we ask the question: Where should these, where should this first aid kit be uh, be located? Well, in an accessible area, it needs to be where people can get to it quickly and easily. Uh, should not be behind a locked uh, a locked cabinet. Um, and uh, and what about mobile workplaces? Should we have mobile first aid kits? And our recommendation is yes, because many times that's where those incidents take place. And if we don't have those supplies, um, we could potentially uh, potentially injure other people, maybe by blood exposure, or that uh, or that injury could get worse. Um, CPR mask is another one that I didn't mention that uh, should be in every first aid kit, um, even though the answer, ANSI standard doesn't uh, doesn't have that there. That helps to protect us from these things, bloodborne pathogens. Um, and uh, makes giving CPR a better experience. And, uh, and uh, so along with bloodborne pathogens, we want to train people on this and then provide appropriate equipment to make sure that they understand the risk of being exposed to somebody's blood or other bodily fluids. So provide adequate protection for them. That would be those, those nitrile exam gloves, um, glasses, safety glasses, um, CPR masks, those type of things, so they can do a good job. In addition to that, we want to add equipment for cleanup and uh, disposal of those type of materials. Blood, how do, we, how do we go about cleaning that up? How do we make sure that it is disinfected? Um, we know that, that hepatitis can live maybe several weeks in dried blood, so it's important that we clean these materials up and uh, don't get anybody else uh, exposed to it. People who are um, providing first aid services need to have need to be offered vaccinations. The the hepatitis series of vac vaccinations in particular. And if they uh, if they refuse that vaccination, you need to have them sign a declination letter that says I've been offered this, but I don't want to have that. Some people have. Um, have opposition, or, you know, have some opposition to vaccinations for whatever reason. Um, so we need to document that if they don't take that. Who gets those vaccinations? Well, it's really if we if we designate somebody as a first responder, or they have a high likelihood that they're going to be cleaning up or providing uh, cleaning up after you know an accident uh, or other bodily fluids, or if if they're uh, uh, you know just by their job duties. They, they would be required to deal with this type of material. Those are the people who should be offered the vaccinations. All right. So what do you do when an injury occurs? Number one, we want to get the appropriate aid to this person. Provide them with, um, with prompt uh, professional aid. Like I said, this is a really bad time. What happens if you, if you slice your wrist open? What happens if something falls on you? Uh, you might be confused, you're, you're scared, so providing that information promptly and professionally is, is important. If it's a 911 type clay, uh, case, if it's an emergency case, dial 911, get EMS there as soon as, uh, as possible. If not, make sure we've got some trained first responders that can help out. Um, on this line, I say take the, take the injured employee to the clinic. Why would, I, why would I encourage you to have a supervisor or lead or somebody, somebody um, in authority take the injured person to the clinic? Well, for a number of reasons. Number one is safety. Um, somebody who has a cut, on their, a cut on their arm and they're bleeding, um, it may not be a serious injury, um, but for certain people, 
the sight of blood may cause them to pass out. They may not, uh, it may not be safe to drive themselves to the, to the clinic. Uh, for other reasons, we want to make sure they get to the doctor. Some people are, are quote unquote allergic to needles. They don't, they know, um, they're going to go in and have to get stitches or, um, or, or a, uh, injection of some sort. They may not want to go or, they're concerned about uh, about maybe having to provide a, a drug screen um, or other type of diagnostic uh, test there. So we want to make sure they get there, so they get the care that they need, and uh, and also so they get to the right doctor, the doctor that will do the job. Um, we encourage you to have an injury packet prepared. Um, that would be like an incident report, one for the for the worker themselves and one for the supervisor to fill out this is what happened. It's great to gather this information as soon as possible so we can report this in a timely fashion and uh, and get this get the ball rolling on on a claim as well as preventing this this type of accident from happening again so we can do our incident investigation. Um, so in that packet, sorry, I didn't click that slide. First, uh, first report of injury for the employee, incident investigation form for the supervisor, um, and uh, a a letter. And and this doesn't necessarily need to go out uh, each time, but if you if you've had some issues with the providers that you have there not sending back restrictions or return to work form, then you might have a letter there that sit, that. Uh, request the physician send that type of, of information to you. Also, it's good to have a job description. Um, the doctor may be asking questions, well, what, what type of job do you do? Um, with the end, end in mind, the doctor wants to figure out what type of, what type of tasks are required and will the restrictions that uh, he or she is, is considering meet those restrictions or, or is this going to be taking the employee off work? So if we have an accurate job description and when I say, when I say accurate, we don't need to be out to the very um, detail of, of exactly what they're doing, but, uh, but broad enough to, to let the, the physician know these are the types of uh, tasks, movements um, that, that the employee may have to do, climbing ladders, sitting, standing, stooping, those type of things so, so the physician knows what's, what they're doing. But be careful on these job descriptions. Don't put everybody may, uh, on their job description may have to, may have to lift 50 pounds. Um, if you think about many of the jobs that are out there, they don't require lifting 50 pounds, 100 pounds. Um, if if that's not a requirement, don't put that in the job description because that might limit our ability to get the employee back to work um, or uh, or to be able to meet restrictions. Um, okay. So injury reporting. Um, report all injuries, no matter what. Um, and, and this is some training that should be given out to all of your employees so they understand that, uh, that whatever it is, they need to report it. Um, and you can put, put some consequences out there, some disciplinary action if they don't. For employees, it should be immediate reporting. If you hurt yourself, you need to tell your supervisor right now, even if it's a minor thing. Um, for management, um, any, anything that involves a workers' compensation claim should be into your workers' compensation coordinator within 24 hours, uh, preferably the same day, so a claim can get started. And uh, and if our adjusters need to do some specific work on that, they can be involved. Okay. Um, why do we want to minimize the lag time? Well, the cost of claims goes up. It goes up very rapidly um, if we have lag time in the claim. Um, Sometimes, sometimes it's because the appropriate care isn't given. Sometimes it's because the uh, the person goes to the wrong type of provider for the for the injury that they've received. Um, sometimes we just it, it, it's it, where we need to understand what the claim what or what the accident was so we can prevent it from happening. So minimize that lag time um, as much as you can. Uh, put on here. Watch out for fraud. There's some times there's some, uh, you know, some warnings, uh, warning signs that might be out there. Hey, I think this is kind of a um, an iffy claim. There's some, something around it. If you notice that, if you suspect fraud, 
Um, just let the let the adjusters know, hey, this is a red flag case. I'm concerned about this. Let them know what your concerns are, and uh, and they'll look into that. Now we don't have this happen uh, very often, but at times that does happen, and uh, and we and this is a form of fraud, and so we want to make sure that we're aware of that and we can handle it right. That costs all of us in the trust money if people are taking advantage of the system. Um, uh, reporting the claim, and uh, those of you that are involved with this, probably this is this is second nature. But you can either call it in or do it online at injuryreport.utahtrust.gov. And here's the steps there: let them know that you're a trust member, uh, the account number, and and let them know who what your organization's name is, and and then just go along with what what the adjusters ask. They'll ask you lots of questions, and uh, and if you put these in online. They will give you a call back within the within the same day. You know, depending on the timing, if it's after hours, um, it might be the first of the next day. Uh, but within 24 hours, you'll have a call back from them to uh, to discuss the case and and get your direction on on where you're going. Uh, here's here's one other consideration. Um, OSHA is is over worker safety, and if you have an injury, a, a significant injury. You have a reporting requirement. So uh, here's here's OSHA's requirements within eight hours of the occurrence of all fatalities, disabling, significant, and serious injuries or illnesses. You need to give Utah OSHA a call. The numbers numbers up there on the screen. Um, and so a lot of people ask me, you know, what what does that mean? What's significant? Um, and uh, the definition I've had from OSHA is if you break your femur. You break your arm, that's a significant injury. If you break your pinky, um, that's not. So kind of think of the magnitude of the injury. If it's a loss of consciousness, hospitalization, amputation, any of those type of injuries need to be reported to, to Utah OSHA. Um, and if you ever have a question on this, please uh, please give Doug, Lance, or myself a call. We'd be happy to kind of walk through the scenario and give give you our opinion on on what to do there. Um, what's the risk of, of reporting? Well, the risk is that OSHA will come out and investigate that, um, and uh, you know that's, that's a legal requirement that you that you have to report those. But if I break my pinky and I um, and I report that, what's the chances they come out? They might. Um, and so and so we want to look through and determine is it appropriate to report or not to OSHA. However. If it's an OSHA recordable injury, that needs to be recorded, not reported, but recorded on your OSHA 300 log. And we've uh, Lance did a, a webinar on this back in February. Uh, you can go back onto our website and watch the and watch the webinar recording of that one if you're if you're interested in how to do this OSHA uh, record keeping. But within seven days, you need to record this injury on that 300 log. All right. Um, next part: How to prepare for these injuries? We want to have predetermined medical facilities. We want to decide where an injured worker is going to go ahead of ahead of this injury happening. So, if it's a, like I said, if it's an, an emergency case, life threatening, dial 911, and, and the ambulance will take that person where they need to go. So you don't have to worry about that. However, we want to work with fire EMS ahead of time. And uh, and work out plans. How do they get into your facility? You know, if you have a a large facility there, uh, you know, which is the which is the appropriate door? Do they have a map? Um, how how can we facilitate them getting in as easily and as safely as as possible to get this injured person out? So working with them ahead of time is a is a really important part. Um, and sharing contact information is also important. For those non-life-threatening in, uh, injuries, we want to make sure that we're using network providers. We have the uh, great, op uh, great, um, what's the appropriate word? Um, in Utah, our our legal system has been a statutory system is set up so so the employer can direct care. Initially, we can say this is the doctor that that you're going to go to and be evaluated. Um, that's to our benefit. So don't uh, don't shirk this responsibility. Make sure that we're directing care. 
And that could be as simple as, as in your policy, say, when you're injured um, and it's non-life-threatening, you go to this clinic. And, uh, and we want to make sure that those are network providers. What's the risk in that? Well, if they go to their, if they go to their own primary care uh, physician, they may not understand workers' compensation system. And, uh, and then they may say, hey, why don't you take a month off of, of work uh, for your stubbed toe? And uh, and that uh, that can end up costing um, your organization as well as as well as the trust membership as a whole a lot of a lot of money that really doesn't need to be spent. So we want to use people people that really know the workers' compensation system and have the skills to provide them the care that they need. Uh, primary care physician may not have the ability to provide some of the some of the uh, type of uh, procedures that a, an industrial clinic has. So how do we know who the right clinics are? Uh, here are the network providers. You can go on to uh, mywcinfo.com, and that will take you into the system, and you can search by zip code or uh, by the type of provider, and it will give you a lot of those. Just uh, the, the standard industrial clinics like the IHC WorkMed, those are, those are providers within the network. Um, so if, if those are ones in your, in your area, um, you know, go ahead and, and use those. This is a place that you can check that. Know who the providers are. Talk, call up and talk to the doctors. So, um, or the or the people that manage the cases there. So they know you. So when something goes in, they're willing to share information and uh, work with you to get people back to work. Um, question questionable stuff. If something doesn't seem right, ask the ask questions about that. If something really seems off, make sure the make sure the adjusters know about that, and they can follow up. If you don't really feel comfortable talking to talking to providers, just let the adjusters do it. That's that's really their job. Um, but we love having having you be involved with this with this process as well, because you're closest to the person, you're closest to the to the uh, um, the issue at hand. Um, after after they receive their treatment. The worker needs to bring all of their paperwork back to your workers' compensation coordinator, and uh, that's the return to work uh, information that says uh, what their restrictions are. You need to review that those restrictions with the employee as well as the supervisor, and then develop a plan to to help them get back to work. If the restrictions are all uh, within their their job duties, you can accommodate those. Then we just make sure that they're that they're following, you know, keep the wound dry or and clean or whatever those recommendations are from the uh, from the physician. Um, and uh, at the injured worker and the supervisor must follow those restrictions. If the doctor provides the restrictions, we need to focus. Uh, we need to make sure that they understand that this isn't optional. Um, they have to they have to follow those sometimes an injured worker says oh i'm fine i can do everything um, and so they go beyond those restrictions and they can be injured uh, re-aggravate or make the injury worse than it was um, particularly we want to make sure supervisors aren't aren't uh, encouraging or making making the injured workers do things that are beyond their restrictions um, i to come up with this plan uh, to for post injury have everybody involved, the supervisor, the employee, the workers' compensation coordinator, review those restrictions against their job duties, their job description, what's their normal job. If we can accommodate that, can we come up with some transitional duty, uh, a job that will help them get back to their, their normal work and still meet the restrictions that they have. Um, like I said, we want to monitor that restriction compliance and make sure that they're, uh, that they're not going beyond what they're supposed to do. Can you discipline somebody for for going outside of their restrictions? Uh, the answer is yes, and we encourage you to, to do to do that. Um, you know, within within reason, um, we would probably want to have a discussion with the employee and document that to start with. But uh, discipline discipline is important um, if they're not willing to do those restrictions. Um, we want to document. You guys get tired of hearing me talk about documentation over and over again, but document the milestones in, in a case. Um, sometimes these, these cases go on for years if it's a serious case. Um, and so with that, I recommend you have a cover sheet. You, you keep a file that has all of the 
paperwork for each each different claim, each different injury that to, that you deal with, and the top sheet of that file um, should be a register or a a history of what uh, have of the different milestones that happened in the claim, date of injury, what the what happened when they go back to to doctor's appointments, and most of these are going to be really simple because they're the the medical only claims. They got stitches and they went back and got the stitches out. Everything's fine. Case is closed. We don't have to deal with that anymore. But somebody uh, somebody ends up with a, a serious back injury. That may end up being a multi-year case, and it's far easier to have those those milestones listed um, on that cover sheet, so you can so you can see in a glance the history of this case, and so you know what's happened. So when you talk to the adjusters, uh, we're not trying to recreate history um, at that time or every time we talk about it. So accommodating light light duty or accommodating restrictions. Um, we'll send out a, a list of light duty jobs, just ideas that we had on different things that you can do. Um, sometimes filing is something that meets a, meets a restriction. Sometimes it, it, it may be something totally, totally different. Um, but let's be creative on this. There, there are many, many opportunities out there. Sometimes we, we just don't open our eyes and say, well, what about this part of the job? Many times it's within the normal job duties that we have. We just need to um, direct this person into the tasks that they can and can't do. Um, sometimes we can transfer an employee to another department that meets the, where the job duties meet their restrictions. Uh, what happens if we do have a, a serious injury? Lost time doctor says this, this employee cannot work for two weeks because they're going to have surgery um, and they need to recover after surgery. Um, important. The things on that is really one: stay involved. Uh, don't just say, "Well, oh, they're off on off on workers' comp." Be involved with them. Make contact with the, with the worker at least once a week. Um, here's here's one pitfall that we find still a few of our members out there doing. They will make up um, that one third. A, a worker off on workers' compensation gets two thirds of their regular wages. And uh, so some of our some of our members out there in the past, and a few currently still, will make up one uh, that one third of their wages. Um, and the reality of things are, is the two thirds of, of wages that they receive under workers' compensation are tax free. And so if we make that up, that could actually pay them more money to stay home uh, on workers' compensation. It's a real disincentive to get them back to work. Um, so. So go with the with the two thirds. If you want to allow them to take sick pay or vacation pay to make some of that up, that's okay. But uh, but we just encourage you not to not to make that up because it's a real disincentive and it'll end up costing you a lot more in the long run, um, and and the employee just won't get well as quickly. Um, work with adjusters, uh, and uh, we believe our, adjust, our adjusters do a good job. And they're good to follow up. Please let us know if you if you ever don't have that experience, and uh, and we'll definitely make sure that 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 um, that they continue to do, provide that good service that they have. But if you have questions, ask those. Ask the adjusters. They're really good to work with. Um, so regular follow up, like I said, is is really important to get an employee back to work. Get uh, um, let that employee knows that know that you care about them. You're concerned about their health and, and getting them back to back to work. Let them know that you've missed them. They're a valuable part of your team, and you need them back. That helps them both psychologically as well as as well as gets their mind. That, hey, the team needs me. I need to get better and and, and get back to work. Um, in addition, you want to let them know that you're aware of what's going on, and they just haven't been forgotten um, sitting out there and in. in the sofa land. Um, let them let them know that you're going to be following up, you know, at least once a week, and and see how they're doing, and 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 what they're up to. Um, as you give them a call if they're out for a back injury, and you can you can hear, uh, you know, the ATVs running in the in the background. You know, maybe pay more attention to 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 what that person's doing. Um, like I said, inter interaction with adjusters. 
ask them questions uh, and uh, and provide them information, and these claims will uh, claims will handle be handled in a much better uh, fashion. Okay. Um, so just in summary, um, just want uh, just want to go over a couple of things here. If we plan and prepare ahead of time, um, then then these injuries won't have to be uh, um, as as bad as they as they potentially could be. Sometimes if we're if we're not prepared, we don't have first responders, we don't have the equipment necessary. This is a real stressful stressful situation. So plan and prepare. Get the workers the care that they need. Go to the right providers so they so they get that. Um, accommodate those restrictions. Get them get them back to work as soon as possible. That's better for the employee and better for uh, better for you and for your premiums and for the trust as a as a whole. We all work together to keep these costs down on on claims. So that should be our ultimate goal: is get them healthy, get them back to work, stay involved with their claims, so they so they understand that you care that you care. And uh, and we all have the same goal of, of getting them back to work. All right. Any questions out there, Doug? Just looking there, I don't see any on my list. If you uh, folks want to ask a question, you can type it in the chat box or the Q and A box there. I'm not seeing anything, Doug. I would just emphasize, and this is going all the way back to the beginning of your presentation. That uh, when you have an employee who's injured, when in doubt, call 911. Uh, lots of times we tend to sit there and overthink, you know, whether this is uh, worthy of calling 911. It's really important that uh, if you do have a situation that is potentially life threatening, with the emphasis being potentially life threatening, you don't have to guarantee that it's life threatening, just has that potential to be life threatening, that we go ahead and call 911, make sure people are getting that proper care as soon as possible. All right. Thanks, That's Doug. I appreciate that. A little tidbit from the uh, from the certification course. So it's, a little, it's a little teaser there, you know, for everybody who's interested in, in what they're going to get in the if, they, if and when they ever come to the first aid CPR training. Great. And and you know what Doug says there, um, if it's potential potentially life threatening, somebody's got a sore wrist, you know, that's that's obvious that um, we're not going to call the ambulance for that. But if somebody has a fall, they have potential head injury or back injury, anything like that, boy, don't hesitate on on those situations to to call 911. Um, you know, severe bleeding, those type of things, absolutely get get them there. Um, trying to see. I don't see any more questions coming in. So I either put everybody to sleep, or it was the clearest presentation they've ever had, and and they understand it all. What do you think, Doug? Well, I see a few exclamation points on the list. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they're asleep. <laughs> well, very good, folks. We'll uh, we'll send some uh, materials out on this uh, a little bit later today. Um, uh, we'll we'll wait until the until the recordings are posted up on the website, and then we'll send out the materials to go along with the with the presentation. Um, if there's oh let's see there was a question that came in. What if an employee has an incident and doesn't report it, but comes back in a week or two and says that the incident caused an injury? Uh, then what is done? Great question. Um, this is this is one place where your policy um, can really help you out. If you will set a policy that requires immediate incident reporting, um, then, you're, then you're empowered to be able to discipline the employee. Um, will they still get workers' compensation coverage for that? Uh, it kind of depends on the, the length of, of time that has gone on. That's why, we, that's why we highly recommend that immediate reporting and that you report anything. Um, because if, if we drag on months, before a report comes in, there's a potential that their their compensability of their claim could be affected. Um, so, so recommend that you do that. Make it a part of your policy that you have to report those uh, report those within a, uh, the time frame that you specify. And I recommend the immediate reporting or within 24 hours uh, at least for for each of the for the employees to to let their supervisor know this has happened. Um, but yeah, great question. Okay, I don't see any other questions there. Thanks, folks, for for tuning in. I went a little bit longer than I than I planned on. Apologize for that. 
Um, hopefully, hopefully we didn't lose too many. Doesn't look like we lost too many. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call myself, Doug, or Lance, and we'd be happy to help you out with that. And if you're interested in um, in additional training, first aid and CPR, those type of things, you can give us a call as well on uh, on that. Thank you very much, and go out and have a safe day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.